So you've got the second installment of 1 Samuel for me. Yes, sir, I do. Not the first installment of 2 Samuel? Nope, that'll be later, sir. Oh, that's so confusing. It's really not. So we're getting introduced to the future king of the Israelites in this one, a fellow named Saul. And what's his deal? He's tall and handsome, and we meet him while he and an attendant are out trying to locate his father's missing donkeys. Okay. And they're not having any luck finding the donkeys, but his attendant remembers that there's a prophet nearby, Samuel, and and he might be able to divine where they are. Oh, mystical donkey detection is tight. It sure is, and it's God's method in this scenario to get Samuel into a position to anoint Saul as Israel's first king. God couldn't simply point Saul out in a crowd and say, that's my guy. Of course he could, but he's not gonna. How come? Because that works. And Saul makes his way to where Samuel is, just like God planned. What is it about Saul that has God convinced that he has the right guy to be king? He's tall and handsome? There must be more. Nope. Well, okay then. Now, we are introducing a new procedure to indicate that we're appointing a king here. Oh, is there going to be a big ceremony with a crown placed ever so regally upon Saul's head? Much later, yes. For now, Samuel is simply going to dump some oil on Saul's head. Oh. God, isn't their hair nasty enough as it is? Apparently not. And then, it's kissy time. What? It's kissy time. Time for Samuel to give Saul a little kiss. Okay. And then the Spirit of God comes powerfully upon him. Ew. No, not like that. Whew. Yeah, God just essentially turns Saul into a new man or something so he can lead the Israelites. Well, great. So Samuel summons the Israelite nation to Mizpah to introduce them to their new king, but lets them know God isn't too happy about them wanting a king in the first place. Wait. God doesn't want them to have a king? Oh, oh, no. He's pretty pissed about that, actually. Really? And why is that? Well, what do the Israelites need a king for? God saves them from all their disasters and calamities. Oh, my eyes. What happened, sir? They rolled so far back into my skull that I think I sprained some ligaments. Well, that's what you get for being overly theatrical while expressing incredulity about God's stewardship of the Israelites. Seriously, are you sure you want to include that particular sentence? He saves them from all their disasters? That's patently absurd, you realize that. Look, I'm going to need you to get all the way off my back about some of the comically delusional hyperbole we'll be describing God with from here on out. Sure, let me get off that thing. Great. Doesn't God personally inflict many of Hey, shut up. So Samuel brings out the Israelite tribes and clans and families one after another to do that whole roll call thing? Is Saul the least in his clan, his clan the least in its tribe, and its tribe the smallest of the Israelites? Wow, this stuff does get repetitive, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, Samuel finally narrows it down to Saul, who is conspicuously absent. Uh... Where is he? He's hiding. <laughs> what? He's hiding. So they ask God where he is, and God tells them that he's hiding amongst the supplies. Oh man, ratted out by God himself. Yeah, so they drag his reluctant ass out of the supply depot and basically say, There he is. Ain't he tall? That's your king. Wow, what a glorious introduction to his subjects. So then, Nahash the Ammonite goes up and besieges Jabesh Gilead. Wait, what? The Ammonites attack an Israelite town. That was quite an abrupt change to the narrative. Are you going to give us any sort of lead up to this military action? Nope. Well, okay then. And did you say the Ammonites are attacking Jabesh Gilead? I did. But didn't you say Jabesh Gilead had been annihilated back in the Book of Judges? Oh yeah, I did. Whoops, whoopsie. Well, somehow Jabesh Gilead is back and this Nahash guy wants to gouge out the right eye of everyone in town. Why? Why not? Whatever. Now the people of Jabesh Gilead have nowhere near enough troops to defend against the Ammonites, so they ask Nahash if he'd be kind enough to hold off his attack for a week so they'll have time to find some reinforcements. And Nahash falls to the ground, laughing hysterically. Nope, he obligingly waits for Jabesh Gilead to acquire some additional troops. Oh, that is just so never going to happen. Well, that's what Larry wrote. Ah, I see. Okay, it's a Larry thing. It's uh, pretty much all a Larry thing. Larry things are, they are modebly not tight. They truly aren't, are they? No, they are not. 
Larry can be surprisingly childlike when he emerges from one of his benders. Aw, that's sort of sweet. It is, but jeez, he has the coherence and attention span of a three-year-old. Sounds like. So the Ammonites, in a stupefying break from all military logic, give Jabesh Gilead a week to bolster their defenses. Yep, and Jabesh Gilead sends out messengers throughout the land to find a rescuer. They better call Saul. They do call Saul, and sure enough, when he gets the news, he's filled with godly spirit, and he threatens to kill the cows of any Israelites who don't help rescue Jabesh Gilead. Winning the hearts and minds through threats of violence. That's very wise of the new king. It is. And just in case that's not enough, God uses his dark Jedi mind powers to terrorize the people into complying. Threats and terror. Saul and God are a fantastic motivational team. Yeah, Tony Robbins can suck it. Who? And over 300,000 Israelites show up just before the Ammonites start the eye gouging, and the Israelites utterly crush them. Nice. And what do they do to Nahash? Pardon me? The Ammonite king. Do they dispatch him in an ironic way like they do with some kings, like, say, gouge out his right eye? Well, no. Huh. Do they cut off his thumbs, step on his neck, impale him? Nope, he's never mentioned again. Seemed like that had become something of a tradition there for a while. Nope, gotta move on. <laughs> Gee whiz. So Samuel's old and gray, and he gives a farewell speech right at the start of chapter 12. Aw, Samuel. Don't worry, he's around for another 13 chapters. Yay, Samuel. And he takes the opportunity to let the Israelites know how evil it was for them to ask for a king. But, but, you've mentioned that, yet God has explicitly facilitated Saul's kingship. Yeah. Then chapter 13 is this muddled mess of events, starting when Saul, with no explanation whatsoever, takes 3,000 men and attacks a Philistine outpost. Oh boy! That pisses off the Philistines, who respond with overwhelming force. Oh no! And the Israelites scatter and hide, waiting a week for Samuel to come bail them out. Samuel! But when he doesn't show up after seven days, Saul makes a burnt offering to God. Yay! I Think. Nope. Samuel shows up right after the offering is made and tells him that was the wrong thing to do. Why? <laughs> Honestly, I have no f idea. That's good enough for me. If I had to guess, I'd say it's because Saul isn't a priest, but screw me if anyone ever thought of actually writing that down. You could write it down now. Nah. And as it turns out, all this time the Israelites haven't had real weapons. What the? What have they been fighting with? Farm implements. Really? How long has that been the case? Unclear. Huh. Yeah, apparently they've been using sickles, pickaxes, and mattocks as weapons. What the heck is a mattock? One of these. I did not know that. Well, now you do. So you're telling me that for some indeterminate amount of time, the Israelites have been engaging in warfare with sword-wielding foes with whatever they could find in the barn. Uh, yeah. That makes no sense. It's never been mentioned nor even hinted at, and yet you want to retcon it in now? Well, it gives us a chance to go over the fee structure of the tool sharpening required to keep them in good working order. What? See, the Israelites don't have any blacksmiths because the Philistines were afraid they'd make swords and spears. Does that sentence even explain anything? It feels like something was left out. And aren't the Israelites and the Philistines in a near permanent state of war with each other? Well, yes. So where are the Israelite blacksmiths? I don't know. And what was that about a fee structure? Since the Israelites don't have their own blacksmiths, they have to go to Philistine blacksmiths to get their implements sharpened. So when they need to get, say, their mattock sharpened, they have to go to the enemy? Yes. And. How did you get my mat? And then the enemy Philistine blacksmith then sharpens the ad hoc weapons that the Israelites are employing against them. Yes, the price was two thirds of a shekel for sharpening plow points and mattocks, and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goads. Does Larry have multiple personality disorder? What? It feels like a lot of the plot of this one has been written by two opposing sides who are in reality working together for a common goal. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, it's hard to articulate what I'm trying to convey here. Let's just wrap this one up. Sure, why not? This one kind of creaked to a halt, huh? Honestly, this was probably the most painful episode yet to adapt for a pitch meeting. Believe that. Who are you talking to? Never mind.